Okay. Today we are going to uh, talk on uh, parts of the body. As you can see in the text, uh, this is very uh, also important uh, uh, part of our meditation. This is sometimes called Patikkula Manasikara. Patikkula means uh, going against the grain as opposed to Anukula. Anukula is going with the grain, going with the stream. Patikkula is going against the stream, against the grain. That means, uh, normally this, uh, the way it is given here, is not the way that people look at their body. They look at the body in a very different way. Somebody the other day asked me a question, when the person looks in the mirror, the person feels very proud or displeased. because uh, that is the normal way of uh, uh, looking at the body. This is going against that kind of way of looking at the body in a more uh, realistic way. When we look at the body in an unrealistic way, we have either uh, we become with the very proud if uh, body appears to us to be very attractive or we will be displeased if the body seems to have something that we don't like very much. This kind of um, uh, emotional reaction is a uh, very uh, usual thing. This kind of meditation is uh, uh, something different going against that kind of regular standard way of looking at the body. And also, sometimes this is called Asubha Bhavana. Uh, Asubha Bhavana is the, I think is a more appropriate term because uh, the Buddha uh, used, even in this uh, particular section, Pura Nana Pakaras Asuchi no Pachavekati. Asuchi is uh, unattractive, unpleasantness of the body. This is a part of mindfulness practice. If we look at the body unmindfully, we have uh, various reactions. When we look at the body mindfully, we will not have many different reactions. We will all have only one kind of uh, way of looking at it. That is a mindful way. There are situations where the Buddha himself has uh, given these instructions to bhikkhus and Bhik Buddha said, bhikkhus, uh, I praised the mindfulness of unattractiveness of the body. Somebody must, uh, uh, the, especially meditators, must uh, spend time looking at the body in a more realistic way and uh, that is for uh, dispassion to reduce uh, greed, uh, attachment to the uh, body. This also is included in one of the ten uh, uh, perceptions called asubhasanya. The ten perceptions are uh, perceptions of impermanence, anicca sanya, anatta sanya, asubhasanya, adhinava sanya, pahana sanya, viraga sanya, 
निरोध संज्ञा सब लोग अनबिरत संज्ञा सब संकार स्वाणिज्य संज्ञा अनापान साथी दीज आर दिन रिफ्लेक्शन वन ऑफ देम इज रिफ्लेक्शन ऑफ द इम्प्यूरिटी ऑफ द बॉडी आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू गो इन टू ऑल दीज पाली टर्म्स बाई आई सिंपली वॉन्ट टू मेन्शन दैट दिस इज वन ऑफ द परसेप्शन वन डे बुद्ध गेव दिस इंस्ट्रक्शन टू अ ग्रुप ऑफ मंग्स एंड वेंट फॉर गिव फॉर हिस्स ऑन रिट्रीट फॉर टू वीक्स रिट्रीट एज यू नो बुद्ध समटाइम्स वेंट फॉर रिट्रीट फॉर थ्री मंथ्स रिट्रीट वन मंथ रिट्रीट एंड टू मंथ्स रिट्रीट टू वीक्स रिट्रीट एंड दिस टाइम ही वेंट ऑन अ टू वीक रिट्रीट When he was away uh, in his retreat, the bhikkhus began to contemplate on the body parts, and they felt so disgusted, so disappointed, and they felt as if uh, you know dead human carcasses hung around their neck. <laughs> they felt uh, so disappointed and uh, they thought why, why should i have, why should we have this body it is so ugly so repulsive so uh, you know unattractive and then there are two versions of the story one in sangyutta nikaya uh, sangyutta nikaya says that these bhikkhus uh, uh, cut their throat and commit a suicide the commentaries in vinaya and uh, uh, sangyutta nikaya commentary story says that uh, these monks went to a sam more uh, ascetic he was uh, not a real ascetic you know fake ascetic uh, they went to him and uh, said uh, uh, you do me a, do us a favor what is the favor they gave him a straight knife razor and said take this straight razor and uh, you cut my throat you can take my arms balls my robes go to the market and sell and get little money when you cut my throat because this this particular man who took initiative to ask this man to cut his throat was so disgusted with his body so this man cut his throat and afterward he thought uh, well this is a good way of making little money so he went from kuti to kuti asking monks whether they want to attain enlightenment very fast <laughs> so, the, so it is said 60 monks like that uh, got their throats cut by this man and when the buddha returned after two weeks retreat he found monks number was dwindling he asked ananda ananda what is the hap- what happened what's the problem what why the what happened to the monks then venerable ananda told the buddha what happened and these 60 months it is said who were uh, who got committed suicide were not living good moral ethical monks life and therefore they thought uh, it would be better for them to kill themselves and those who are very mindful did not die like that that is one story another story is uh, there was a student of venerable sariputta he also was very lustful monk so whenever he went to he he venerable sariputta gave him this subject of meditation you go sit down under a tree and reflect on the parts of the body and contemplate on the Uh, impurities of the body 
this monk as he was very lustful began to contemplate on them but he chose a wrong body <laughs> not his own body therefore his lust increased instead of decreasing he came back to our sariputra and said so it doesn't work <laughs> my, my lust increases sariputra said to no said to him no no it is a good subject go and use that subject meditate on that you can get rid of your this lust second time he tried the same thing and got worse a third time he came to the sariputta and reported and third time finally when the sariputta took him to the buddha you know when the sariputta was fully enlightened monk he was very very intelligent extremely wise monk and even he could not give an appropriate subject for meditation to his own student therefore it is not very easy for a teacher to give a appropriate subject to any students to meditate according to their temperaments anyway uh, finally he thought of taking him to the buddha and he took him to the buddha and presented him to him and uh, then buddha said uh, okay of course buddha had lot of flowers people say buddha created lotus buddha did not have to create lotus flower because every time somebody went to see the buddha they carried flowers just like today when people go to monastery they carry flowers those days it was a common thing that whenever people went to see the buddha they carried lot of flowers all around him were flowers that is why his uh, kuti was called gandha kuti gandha kuti means uh, perfume chamber buddha's chamber was perfumed always because always there were fresh new flowers people brought so it was very easy for him to pick up one one of the lotus flowers and uh, fresh flower and gave to this monk <coughs> and said you take this lotus there is a pond sit there near the pond stick this lotus in the ground and sit in front of it and contemplate on the color of the flower see sariputta gave him an object of, of a repulsive object object of impurities buddha gave him an object of pleasantness pleasant object just the opposite of what vinabhar sarbhuta gave him so this monk stuck the flower on the in the ground sat in front of it and started meditating meanwhile there were some children they also came and picked some flowers from that pond put on the ground and in the very hot uh, scorching sun all these flowers including the one he got from the buddha slowly began to wither this beautiful color changed petals faded collapsed and the whole flower collapsed when he was contemplating on that very nature of impermanence that triggers triggered his wisdom and he had an enlightenment he was not dull he was very intelligent monk very smart monk and all he needed was a right subject and buddha found this monk has been a goldsmith many 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 lives in the past even in that life before he became a monk he was a goldsmith as a goldsmith he loved to see the color of gold it was so familiar color for him so he focused on it first he was attracted to the color 
and then focus the mind on the color. And as she was focusing, color slowly changed and flower turned into withered, pale, dead flower. Now, why those 60 monks committed suicide and why this particular monk could not attain enlightenment by using the same subject? If they could not attain enlightenment by using this subject, why did the Buddha recommend this as a part of our subject of our vipassana meditation? This subject has to be studied and uh, used as an object uh, to develop mindfulness. If we use this unmindfully, you will develop a lot of emotions. You the, either you reject it because when you look at something and if it is repulsive you develop resentment, anger, loathsomeness and try to reject it. That is the nature of anger, rejecting. That is one extreme. Or you become attracted like this Sariputta's disciple because he was not mindful. When you are mindful, you don't fall into one extreme or the other. One extreme is becoming attached to it. Other extreme is rejecting, cultivating hatred. Therefore, this subject has to be dealt with mindfulness. It's a delicate subject, very important subject. It is called uh, sometimes people call it particular manasikara, uh, reflection on the uh, impurities of the body. So this starts with uh, uh, two parameters. One, ado uh, kesa mattaka, from the tip of your ha hair on the head, uddang padatala ado kesa mat uddam ado padatala uddang kesa mattaka. The top is the end of your hair on the head. The bottom is the end of your feet, the toes. In between these two, these are the, this is the perimeter, the boundary. Within this boundary, there are these parts of the body. And this, out of this, we call 32 parts, including the brain, which uh, in uh, some people say later uh, Pali texts. I think Kuddaka uh, may not be that late because we find brain in the, included in Kuddaka as well. Including that there are 32 parts. And these 32 parts are divided into six groups. You can see the six groups here. Yes. Uh, 20 <coughs> parts of the body divided into four groups, each having five, and 12 parts of the uh, water element divided into two groups, uh, each having six. So first is earth element, which has 20 parts, and the last is water element, which has 12 parts. And in this uh, discourse, uh, in this particular translation, uh, they are divided into these uh, six categories. In order to make the meditation easy, uh, it takes, uh, I think, six months or five months to complete. 
the practice. If one takes this as an object of meditation, it would take, I think, uh, uh, six months. I don't remember exactly how long. Almost about six months. But <coughs> that is, of course, a uh, commentarial uh, uh, explanation or commentarial uh, uh, method of using these 32 parts. But uh, I don't think we should limit a period of time for this practice. It can be two weeks, three weeks, one week, six months, doesn't matter how long. So long as you get the idea, get the a clear picture of uh, these 32 parts, when we practice these 32 parts in a in a uh, with mindfulness, what we develop is neither hatred nor craving, then what? We develop equanimity, equanimity. It is, it is uh, stated in Sutta number 152 in Nikaya, last Sutta, Buddha said, when we practice uh, uh, this meditation, the meditator, when he or she comes across the pleasant object, uh, he can develop equanimity, or when one sees unpleasant object, he can develop an equanimity. Or when one comes across unpleasant, uh, pleasant object uh, or ne neutral object, he can develop equanimity. Uh, so the mind will remain equanimous with regard to the parts of the body. Buddha has given a very beautiful uh, uh, simile in this particular section. That simile. Uh, if you look at the simile very mindfully, you can see the meaning or the way the attitude of uh, the meditator's attitude towards this kind of practice uh, is very clear in that simile. Simile says, suppose there is a bag full of grains. The bag has two openings. Bottom opening is closed and uh, the top opening, uh, or, uh, top part of the mouth will open. For someone to, someone with clear eyesight to see what is inside. In the bag there are grains, all kinds of grains, so rice, uh, hill rice, uh, paddy, dal, moom dal, barley, sesame, sesame seed, and uh, mustard seed, and all kinds of seeds in the, you can see the names of the seeds in the text. You can put any number of seeds or 32 kind of seeds inside. And you open the bag for someone with good eyesight to look inside, inside the bag. When you open it and show it to somebody with good uh, clear eyesight, he, will, he or she will look at it and uh, identify these grains, he would say, this is rice, this is dal, this is barley, this is sesame seed, and so forth and so on. He just identifies them, recognizes them. He does not say, this is barley, I hate barley. He does not say, this is sesame seed, I love sesame seed. He does not have that kind of emotional reaction. He simply recognizes 
the grain exactly as they are. That is mindful recognition, recognition with equanimity. So, when you do this meditation, the ultimate result is to, is to develop insight and equanimity towards the body. That is not the way that we look at the body and that is why this is called Patikula Manasikara. So, to start with this practice, since it has been divided into six categories, the first category is Kesa Loma Naka Danta Tacho. That is hair on the head, body hair, nails, teeth, and skin. This, these five are very important, not others are unimportant. These five are more important. More important. Why? There are many reasons. When we receive ordination, novice ordination, first time, these are the five we recite, forward and backward, three times. And uh, sometimes people who are who have uh, almost completed their perfections, completed their parami. If their paramis are good, at the end of reciting these three, these five for three times, the person will attain the stream entry because these are very powerful. Five parts of the body, powerful in many sense, many ways. Hair on the head is one very powerful object. Hair on the head is very powerful object. On the other hand, hair on the head uh, is a good subject for meditation. How do we look at the hair on the head? We don't look at the hair on the head as a, an object of meditation. We look at the hair on the head as an object of beauty. In Asian tradition, <coughs> a woman who has long hair, uh, uh, the, the, the most beautiful woman uh, is supposed to have five uh, attractive parts, that's called pancha kalyana. Pancha kalyana. Kalyana means auspicious, five auspicious or five attractive, five beautiful marks. One of them is hair, long hair. Long hair. When you have long hair, from a distance, if the hair touches your ankle, when you uh, open it and that uh, makes that woman attractive. That is an Indian, Asian way of looking at, at the uh, woman. But hair on the head actually is a garbage can. <laughs> all the lies, <laughs> all the hair dandruff, <laughs> all the dirt accumulate on the head. <laughs> you just, just uh, smell the head. <laughs> when you go to hair, there's a first thing she or he would do would put some shampoo on the head <laughs> because she or he cannot get close to the head hair. It is so smelly. <laughs> Don't take offense. That is why I heard. <laughs> they say 
it is so, so smelly, they had to put shampoo first. <laughs> Spray shampoo on the head and then get close, then do whatever they want to do. <laughs> it has a lot of, you have to comb it, uh, you have to wash it, you have to shampoo it, all the dendrite accumulate, all the dirt, dead skin accumulate there. <coughs> we have to keep it very clean all the time. You, are, you have to scratch it, <laughs> you know, when it is uh, dirty. But from outside, when you look at hair of somebody, that looks attractive. And uh, I don't want to go, <laughs> go into all these details, you know, the amount of money people spent on this, uh, on keeping head uh, or uh, head hair in the shape that they want it to be. <coughs> people love to keep their hair. For some reason, if people begin to fall, you know, they start hair, start falling, then they do, do all kind of things and uh, they sh used to cover it with little hair, whatever little hair they have to, you know, cover the bald head. We, we do <laughs> all sort of things to maintain our hair, to make it look attractive. <laughs> Occasionally, <laughs> hair also is used for some holy purposes. You know, when uh, Hema Mala brought the Buddha's tooth relic from India to Sri Lanka, she twisted her, her hair into a knot and hid the relics in a hair knot so that uh, she could conceal it and nobody would steal it. This is uh, in, in Buddhist legend in Sri Lanka, uh, what do you call Datha Vansa, <coughs> we, can, uh, we can read that story. She used her hair to hide the tooth relics to bring to Sri Lanka uh, so that nobody would know it, notice it. Anyway, <coughs> we also worship hair relics of the Buddha. In Burma, there is a pagoda. The Swedugan pagoda is a very famous pagoda, which uh, they think has the Buddha's relics. <coughs> anyway, hair on the head is considered to be attractive, be 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 beautiful mark. So we had to use it as an object of meditation to see how impermanent it is. Hair is impermanent. That's why we have to do all sort of things for the hair. As we grow older, hair also grows older. And uh, we have to contemplate on that. We have to think, we have to mindfully reflect on the very nature, true nature of our hair. Hair on the head. And also we have to see, hair is actually not very, uh, very pleasant thing. You admire somebody's hair, and if that admirable, beautiful hair, one of them fall into your own soup, <laughs> would you, would you think, you may admire when the hair is on that person's head. But if that hair, one of them falls into your bowl of soup, you don't like it. <laughs> and you admire your own hair, but when while you are eating, if one of your hair falls into your own bowl of soup, you don't like that. So long as it is there on the head where it belongs to, it's okay. The moment it leaves, Nobody likes that. It is not like a flower. Flower, you admire whether it is on the tree or when it is picked. Hair is not like that. <coughs> so, this 
attitude will change when we mindfully reflect on the hair. When we mindfully reflect on the hair, on the uh, hair on the head, then it doesn't matter whether hair is on the head or on the plate or on, on your uh, uh, plate or soup. Because your attitude is the same. You know, we read in Buddhist literature <coughs> that uh, a monk was going on Pindapata. A person suffering from leprosy <coughs> came and served food, put food in his bowl. While putting food in his bowl, one of the finger knuckles separated from the finger and dropped into the arms ball. Just leprosy, leper's finger fell into the arms ball. He did not throw away, he did not have any repulsive attitude, he did not hate it, he just brought his arms, collected arms food and mindfully he ate. See, for an average person, it is so repulsive. For an average person, what is repulsive is not repulsive for a person who understands the nature of these parts of the body. Therefore, don't think that we are meditating on this part of the body to make us or develop a repulsive attitude towards the body. <coughs> We do this meditation to cultivate the correct, right, true attitude towards the body. <coughs> that is, they all are impermanent. What is impermanent is not repulsive. It is impermanent because that is the nature. Repulsive or non-repulsive is the emotional reaction. When we cultivate mindfulness, we don't cultivate an attitude. It is not an attitude. But we cultivate insight into seeing the reality as it is. And therefore, don't misunderstand whenever we talk about repulsiveness of the body or uh, uh, unattractiveness of the body and so forth. We are trying to develop insight into the true nature of our body and bodily parts. <coughs> Second is hair on the body. Hair on the body also is sometimes attractive. Sometimes a man who has beard, good beard, he would make many different shapes out of that beard. <laughs> Cut in a different way, twist it in a different way, and grow it, shave it, and all sort of things, just to make the beard look attractive. <laughs> that is the normal, ordinary way. <clears throat> and also the same beard will be repulsive when it is separated from the body. But when we look at the beard or beard or any you know hair on the body in a, a proper perspective in a most realistic way it doesn't matter whether the beard is on the body or the hair is on the body or on the plate. Because we have already realized the true nature of this hair. <coughs> then the, the next is uh, nails also, so long as the nails are on our fingers, they are useful, attractive, even protect our muscles, finger muscles. <coughs> uh, but when they are out of our finger, 
they are not attractive. But when we understand the true nature of fingernails or toenails, it doesn't matter. They are the same. They are all impermanent. <coughs> then uh, skin and uh, teeth. Uh, also, so long as teeth are in good shape, in the mouth, they are very useful, attractive. But once it comes out, no matter how useful, how beautiful the tooth was before, one minute before, it was very beautiful. When you go to a dentist and dentist pulls it out and put it on your palm, you don't know to carry it home. You give it back to her or him as a gift and <laughs> come home. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether it is in the mouth or out, so long as we have mindful reflection on our teeth. <clears throat> that is, teeth are impermanent. Just like everything else, they are impermanent. The last is skin. Skin also is a sign of attraction and so-called beauty. Uh, beauty is skin deep, they say. Uh, if the skin is in a of certain shape and color and the smoothness and so forth, it is beautiful. But just imagine if the same skin for somehow if you cut little bit of the same skin and put onto your food while you are eating, do you eat that? Same skin. Why? Because that is the attitude people have. <clears throat> if you think it is beautiful, next moment it becomes ugly because of the wrong perception, distorted perception. When we mindfully look at the skin, it doesn't matter whether it is on the body or on the plate. All the same. <clears throat> so, the purpose of cultivating this, practicing this mindfulness is to gain mature, insightful understanding of the true nature of the body and bodily parts. That's a mindfulness insight med meditation practice. <coughs> and also it is very important to remember that these parts we use uh, only visible, five visible parts first. When we gain insight into the five visible parts and gain true deep understanding of the five visible parts, then we can use our imagination to reflect upon other invisible parts. The parts inside the skin are not visible, but what happens to the visible parts happens to the invisible parts. Just the skin, skin changes <coughs> because skin changes not, uh, skin, skin doesn't change only from outside. What we see outside is what has happened inside. Something has happened inside which manifests on outside. The skin <coughs> wrinkles not only from outside, but it starts inside, inside the body, uh, the bodily <coughs> parts change, the underneath uh, skin uh, parts change, and therefore it, uh, the wrinkles appear on the surface of the skin. So we, we go, from, go from known to the unknown, visible to invisible, 
and gain insight into the inside part of the body. <coughs> that means we go to the other remaining uh, uh, 26 parts using our imagination. What happens to these five parts happen to other 26 parts as well. That is insight. <coughs> this meditation, this, these 32 parts also can be used as a object of uh, gaining uh, concentration, gaining samadhi, gaining jhanas. How can we use these parts to gain jhana or concentration? <coughs> there again we must remember, if we have emotional reaction to these 32 parts, we will never be able to gain concentration because mind will become very uh, disturbed, uh, restless, uh, because of the repulsive uh, feeling. In order to gain concentration, we got to use the color of these parts of the body. For instance, we use hair. <coughs> as a part. If the hair is, if you use, you want to use your own hair, if it is uh, dark, you use that as uh, an object of your meditation. It turns out to be a blue in, uh, in your meditation, as a ob meditation object. <coughs> and then focus your mind on that blueness of hair. That is what is called kasina. If, the, if you have a blonde hair or white hair, focus your mind on that, that would be your color, blonde color or white color. And focus your mind on that and that becomes your kasina object. At that time, you do not think of impermanence, unsatis <coughs> unsatisfactoriness, selflessness of hair but you just focus the superficial appearance on the hair. Superficial appearance. Superficial appearance is that particular color. You focus the mind on it exclusively until the body becomes calm, relaxed, peaceful. You, as soon as you gain a relaxed, calm, peaceful state, mind naturally becomes full of joy leading to happiness, then you gain concentration, <coughs> suppressing all your hindrances. So, when we look at our parts of the body impartially, with mature attitude, realistic attitude, without emotional reaction, you can use these bodily parts to gain insight or concentration not average ordinary people, ordinary person would uh, understand the way how we use bodily parts to develop insight or to gain concentration. <coughs> Therefore, this meditation is extreme, as I said at the beginning, is extremely powerful, meaningful, very realistic. Only insight meditators can understand and use this as an, as an object of their insight meditation. And I said at the beginning, <coughs> although commentaries and sub-commentaries and later uh, teachers say that we have to practice each uh, group uh, so many weeks and then go to the next group and so many weeks and so forth. Uh, but I think it is uh, 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 too um, tedious 
and also very uh, regimental. Uh, therefore, the more practical way is you choose some people some people can gain uh, insight very quickly. Even the first five parts are enough. Within few days, within a week, they get gain insight. They don't have to spend six months to complete. Even if you take some, uh, somebody who is very sharp and keen in his uh, insight, that person might need only one of them, one of these 32 parts to reflect, to gain insight. When, for instance, when one takes one, say, hair on the head and reflect on it with impartial attitude, with mindfulness and understand the changes that has taken place the, uh, on your hair. You gain insight into impermanence. Then that insight, that understanding helps you to understand the impermanence of everything else, all other remaining parts of the body. So, uh, the success in gaining insight depends on individuals a state of mind, individual development of spiritual faculties and the temperaments uh, and parami, intensity, uh, sincerity, repetition and so forth. And therefore, uh, I don't think we have to uh, dwell upon uh, this for so many weeks and months uh, to gain insight. <coughs> so, at the end, just like in an, any other section, uh, so you see the parts of the body just like you see grains in a bag hmm? with an impartial attitude. And then at the end you say, itya jatang wa kaya kaya nupasivirati, bahiddhava kaya kaya nupasivirati, Samudra Dhamma and Pasiva Kaisming Virdi, Vaya Dhamma and Pasiva Kaisming Virdi, Samudra Vaya Dhamma and Pasiva Kaisming Virdi, and so forth. That means the mindful meditator reflects that uh, the mi becomes mindful of uh, internally and becomes mindful of uh, externally. Hmm? He dwells contemplating the body as body internally. He dwells contemplating the body as body externally. Now, as I said at the beginning that the word internally and externally does not may mean uh, inside part and ex outside part of the same body. That simply means reflecting on one's own 32 parts of the body as internally and then one need, once one gain full, perfect, complete control of one's own bodily parts, only then one should think, reflect that all other beings, parts of their bodies are exactly like this. Don't individualize, isolate a person. When you reflect on other persons, you, we always have to reflect on the parts of our own body. Remember, we always must remember the domain, clear comprehension of the domain, the field. The field of our meditation is our own body and mind. That we always have to keep in mind. Once we have gained full knowledge, understanding, insight, wisdom into our own body and mind, only then we reflect on others' bodies and minds. That means you generalize, well, this is what is happening to everybody else. What happens to this body? 
these 32 parts of this body, the same thing happens to other thir the 32 parts of all other bodies. Without isolating, individualizing, particularizing any other being. Sariputta's disciple did not have this insight. That is why he got into trouble. Those 60 monks did not practice this with mindfulness. That is why they got into trouble. This meditation has to be done with mindfulness. Only then we can become successful in using these 32 parts of the body. I think this may be enough for today's Dhamma talk. <laughs>